Hallelujah. Praise God. From whom all blessings flow. Thank you, Pastor Tony, for the privilege to be on this platform to be a blessing to God's people. I don't take it for granted. Grace Chapel, hi to all of you. May God bless you all. Amazing family. Um, I count it a great privilege to be associated with Grace Chapel, Chesterfield, United Kingdom. I remember my first ministration was 2009. Maybe sometimes in March 2009 or April, I'm not sure exactly the month, but we had a fabulous time. And since then, my heart is knitted with Grace Chapel and Pastor Toy and his family. Thank you so very much. And I um, want to thank God for this privilege to be a blessing to God's people. And I pray none will go back the same way they came in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So today, I'm, I'll be speaking on the theme, uh, the topic I've been given for the day, for today, Sunday, uh, 26th. And our topic is manifestation or manifesting the glory. Manifestation of the glory, or we, we can call it manifesting the glory. First of all, we need to look at some basic points. My Father, my God, I want to thank you that you will use me for your glory and that your words will come with power. Speak through me and bless the people. Bless those watching us by live broadcast on Facebook, YouTube, those who are on Zoom right now. Bless the church, Chesterfield, United Kingdom, Grace Chapel. Bless everyone who's watching us. Bless your children. Touch lives. Transform lives. Use me for your glory. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. All the people said, Amen and Amen and Amen. Praise God forevermore. So we go into the word. What is this glory? We're talking about manifesting or manifestation of his glory. As a matter of fact, in the book of Romans chapter 8 and verse number 18, the Bible declares, it says, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time is not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. That's Romans 8, verse number 18, through to verse number 20 and 21. For the creature is subject to bondage, not willingly, but by reason of him that has subject the same to hope. And the creature shall be back from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the sons of God. But what fascinates me there more is the fact that the Bible says that the earnest expectation of the creature is waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. So, in other words, Paul was saying that something has been put in you, something has been put in me as sons and daughters of God that the world is waiting to see. See, we're not talking about God giving us glory. Now, if you're a child of God, you are born again, you're a believer, born of the Spirit, you are a carrier of God's glory. If you have received the Holy Ghost, you have received the glory. There's a connection between the Holy Spirit and glory. There's a connection between the Holy Ghost and glory. And I'm going to show you right now, and then you discover that every child of God, everyone who's born again, everyone who's filled with the Holy Spirit, you actually have a measure of the glory of God in you. You have the measure of the glory of God in you. Who is this glory? I won't say what is the glory. Uh, the glory, in a way, is not a what. The glory is who is the glory. You want to know who the glory is? You want to know for the purpose of discussion? Or you want to know what the glory is? But the act in reality, who is this glory? In the book of Romans chapter number 6, let's go to Romans chapter 6, and then we see from verse 1. Just follow me. 
What shall we what shall we say then? If shall we continue saying that grace may abound? God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer daring? For ye know, for know you not that so many of us as were baptized, verse number three, into Jesus were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. I want to note that there. Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father. Let me ask you. How was Christ raised up from the dead? How? He was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father. Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father. So if I ask you, who raised Christ from the dead? The answer is the glory of the Father. Who raised Jesus from the dead? The answer is the glory of the Father. So the glory of the Father actually raised Christ from the dead. That's another way of saying Jesus was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. So don't forget that. Then, let's go further. Romans 8, Romans 8, verse number 11. Verse number 11. It says, But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you. The spirit of him that raised up Jesus dwells in you. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by the spirit that dwells in you. So Romans 8, 11 shows clearly that Christ was raised from the dead by the Holy Spirit, by the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost actually raised Jesus from the dead. The Spirit of the Father, or the Holy Spirit, raised Jesus from the dead. I went to Romans 8, verse 11. So let's combine Romans 6, 4 and Romans 8, 11. Romans 6, 4 says, Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. All right? He was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. Romans 8, 11 now switches and tells us Christ was raised from the dead by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit that dwells in you and I was the Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. So if I combine Romans 6, 4 and Romans 8, 11, then it follows that Jesus was raised from the dead by the Holy Ghost, who is the glory of the Father. Therefore, the Holy Ghost is the glory of the Father. The Holy Spirit is the glory of the Father. So that's, that's, that brings me to the point that I'm trying to uh, uh, emphasize that if you have the Holy Ghost in you, then you have the glory of the Father inside of you. So the glory of the Father, you are, will now agree that the glory of the Father is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the glory of the Father. So when we're talking about the glory of God the Father, is a who? Who is the glory of God the Father? The Holy Ghost is the glory of God the Father. So the Holy Spirit is the glory of God the Father. Now, the Holy Ghost is in you. So the glory of the Father is in you. Come on, say, the glory of the Father is in me. The glory of the Father is in me. The glory of the Father is in me because I have the Holy Ghost in me. So if you have the Holy Spirit in you, then the glory of the Father is in you, brother. Is it you, sister? But now let's go to the next point. In the book of John's Gospel, chapter number 17, let's see something very interesting in John's Gospel, chapter 17 here. John chapter 17. John's Gospel, chapter number 17. And then we'll read from verse number 21 and 22. John's Gospel 17, 21 and 22. That they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me 
and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may know, believe that thou hast sent me. Then look at verse 22. Verse 22 is very important. Verse 22 is very key. So I want you to focus, look at verse 22, see what the Bible is saying in verse 22. It says, and the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them that they may be one, even as we are one. The glory you gave me, I have given them. So what did Jesus, what did God give to Jesus that he now gave to us? He says, the glory you gave me, John 17, 22. The glory you gave me, I have also given them. I have transmitted the glory you gave me. I have given to them. I have transmitted the glory to them. Hallelujah. Now, let's move further. What is this glory? Or who is this glory? The Holy Spirit is the glory of the Father. And Jesus said, concluded, I have given them the glory. The glory you gave me, I have transmitted it to them. Now, this glory is, is, has components, several components, or several um, um, cells that makes up who the glory is, what the glory is. I, I, I call it the five P's of the glory of God. The five P's, the five P's that is expression of the glory. The five P's that, are, that is the expression of God's glory, manifestation of his glory. Five P's, P for Papa. The first one is the presence of God. The glory of God is referred to that the glory of God encapsulates God's presence. That's what the glory. So the, the presence of God is a subset of the glory of God. Now look at my five fingers. My five fingers are all what makes up my hand. My five fingers make up my hand. My hand is symbolic of the glory. The five fingers are part of my hand. The presence of God the first P, the power of God, the second P, the purity of God, the third P, the personality of God, and prosperity of God. These are the five elements or five components of the glory. So we have the, the presence, the power, the purity, personality, and prosperity. Those are the five fingers that makes up the hand. So the hand is, is directly proportional to the glory. The glory of God, the fingers, are those components I just mentioned. So when we're talking about God's divine presence, the presence of God fills the place, the presence of God. Somebody carries God's presence. We're saying it carries God's glory. Somebody, well, we say the power of God is manifested. The power of God is being manifested. We're saying it's the manifestation of the glory. However, the power is just a fraction of what the glory is. His divine presence is a fraction of what the glory is. His personality, that's his person. His person. When we say his personality, we're talking about his character, his nature, goodness, kindness, mercy, etc. They are a fraction of what the glory is. Then we'll talk about his purity, holiness. They are a fraction of what the glory is. Isaiah saw the glory of God. And he saw, he saw the dimension of purity. And he said, I am undone. Isaiah chapter 6, you read it there. He says, I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of people who are of unclean lips. My eyes have seen the Lord, the glory of the Lord. And I've seen my impurities. I am impure. I am undone. Why? Isaiah saw God's glory. But the dimension he saw, the part of the glory he saw was the purity of God. He saw that part of purity of God. And he said, I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. My eyes have seen the glory of God. Hallelujah. So, so, so the glory of God, and then we talk about his prosperity. I'm coming to all that. Where Joseph said, go and tell my father of all my glory in Egypt. Uh, Genesis 45, verse 13. Genesis 45, verse 13. Go and tell my father of all my glory in Egypt and all that you have seen. So in that context, the glory is referred to as the manifestation of prosperity. 
when God prospers you financially, materially, genuine prosperity is a display of the glory. It's all I can see the glory of God over you. That's a, an angle of the glory. So Joseph said, go and tell my father, uh, uh, Genesis 45 verse 13, go quickly go and tell my father of all my glory in Egypt and all that you have seen. So the glory of God is the splendor, the radiance, the effulgence of God, the radiance of God, the splendor of God, the, the, uh, the glory of God is God's value, is God's nature. The glory of God is God's honor. Okay, in some places, the, the word honor and glory are used interchangeably. So when Joseph said, go and tell my father of all my glory in Egypt, he's saying, go and tell him of all my honor. That's my prosperity, the honor, the splendor you have seen. Okay, I pray for someone that is sound of my voice. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, may you begin to manifest the splendor of God in form of prosperity. May you begin to manifest God's honor. May the honor of God be seen upon your life. May the splendor of God be seen upon your life in the name of Jesus. I prophesy, I declare over you, may the glory of God be manifest through you in the name of Jesus Christ. May God's personality be seen in your life. God's nature, God's character, God's goodness, God's kindness. They will see you as a replica of who God is. That's the manifestation of the glory in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. I pray for someone that sound of my voice. May you be a carrier of God's divine presence. Like Jesus, everywhere he went, the apostles, they carried God's divine presence. And there were signs and wonders that manifested and the devils could not hold them bound. May you express God's glory in form of his power. Do not miss power. The Bible says, Jesus said to, to Mary, he says, if thou wouldest believe, John chapter 11, I have said to you, if thou wouldest believe, thou wouldest see the glory of God. That's what Jesus said. You will see the glory of God. He was trying to the power demonstration. If you believe, he said to Mary and Martha, you will see the glory of God. And they believed and they did what? They saw the glory of God. Power of God. So the power, the presence, personality, purity, and prosperity encapsulate what the glory of God is. You must manifest these five components of the glory of God. You must manifest the five. One of them, all of them, two of them, three of them, or all of them. You must manifest God's glory in purity, in, in his personality, his nature, in, in, in terms of carrying his presence, demonstration of his power, and in prosperity and splendor. Hallelujah. We must carry God's glory. Amen. Now, let's go further. I feel something is about to happen here on this platform. People are about to be released into their destiny. People are about to be blessed, mighty, marvelous, and powerful in the mighty name of Jesus. So let's go back. Jesus said, the glory you gave me, I have given to them. I have given them the glory. The one you gave to me, I have transmitted it to them. That's the person of the Holy Ghost. It's in you, brother. It's in you. And you see, you say, well, the Holy Ghost is in me. Why am I not seeing the manifestation? It's possible that, if, now, now, let me tell you this. There's what I call the manifest presence of God. And there's what I call the dormant presence of God. In the lives of some believers, the Holy Ghost is dormant. In the lives of some believers, the Holy Ghost is active. There's what we call dormant states of the glory or active states of the glory. In your life, is the Holy Ghost dormant or is he active? There's dormant, there's active. Now, I'm going to give you examples because you see, many of us say, well, now, if you are filled with the Holy Ghost as a child of God who is baptized in the Holy Spirit, you feel with the Holy Spirit, but you're probably not seeing manifestations of this dimension of the Holy Ghost, these components of his glory, uh, presence, divine presence, power, purity, his personality, his prosperity, and so on and so forth. Why? Well, let's now go a bit further. All right? In the book of Exodus chapter 25, the Almighty God told um, Moses to build him an ark. It is called the Ark of the Covenant or the Ark of Testimony. The Ark is called Ark of the Covenant or Ark of Testimony. 
And God gave him description of the ark, all right, in Exodus 25. And God gave him description of the ark and uh, the configuration of the ark. And then one of the amazing things the Lord said to Moses is, the ark of the covenant will be kept in the Holy of Holies, and I'll come there and I'll meet, I'll speak with you from on top of the mercy seat. On top of the ark, on top of the ark is the mercy seat. Let me ask you, when the Bible puts mercy seat on top of the ark, figuratively speaking, or metaphorically speaking, uh, what does that mean? Figuratively speaking, metaphorically speaking, what does it mean? What does it mean? It means this. There's a place for God on top of the ark. That mercy seat, Exodus 25, that mercy seat is where God is supposed to dwell. Exodus 25, and I'll read verse number 21. Exodus 25, 21. And thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark. And in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. That's the Ten Commandments. The word of God must be inside of the ark. So that brings us to a point where I'll be saying to you that the more of the word you have in you, the more of the manifestation of the glory. The more of the word, the more of the manifestation of the glory. You see, we're coming to that. The, the commandments, the Ten Commandments, was kept inside of the Ark of the Covenant. The Ten Commandments was kept inside of the Ark of the Covenant. And so, verse 22, Exodus 25, 22, and there I will meet with you. That's what God said. I'm going to meet with you there on top of the Ark, on top of the mercy seat. I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims, which are upon the ark of the testimony of all, of, of all things, which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. Did you see that? So Exodus 25, verse 21 and 22, tells us clearly that the Almighty God will commune with you and I from on top of the mercy seat. So this brings us to the point where we are saying now that the mercy seat is the position where God occupies. God occupies the mercy seat in the, uh, in the tabernacle, uh, uh, on the Ark of the Covenant. He sits there. Why is it called mercy seat? Somebody has to sit there. And then the cherubims have their wings spread, you know, facing each other. The cherubims facing each other have their spring, wings spread under, on top of the mercy seat. That's covering and protection. I'm coming to that, or let me just check in that. When you're a carrier of the glory of God, protection and covering is guaranteed. The glory of God will be your guard, will be your rear guard. The glory of God will be protection around you. So the cherubims were stretching their hands and they were covering, you know, the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat. So the mercy seat there, that seat is empty, physically speaking. But spiritually speaking, Jehovah God occupies that seat called the mercy seat. That's why it said, I read again in chapter 25 of Exodus, verse 22, and there, that's upon the mercy seat, I will meet with you. I have an appointment with you there. And I will speak with you, commune with you, okay, with thee from above the mercy seat. So I will be on top of the mercy seat, says the Lord, and I'll be communing with you on the mercy seat. All right, now let's come to terms with this. In a nutshell, the Ark of the Covenant is symbolic of the glory of God. If I go further, you watching me, a child of God, filled with the Holy Spirit, you are symbolic of the Ark of the Covenant. So you can say the Ark of the Covenant is a prototype of a child of God. How do I know? The Ark of the Covenant is gold-plated. That's purity, holiness. 
He made of shitting wood. The shitting wood is salvation, incorruptible wood. Being born again, not by corruptible seed, but by incorruptible seed, by the word of God. So the shitting wood is a special kind of wood that is incorruptible, all right? Made of shitting wood and gold plated. So shitting wood is salvation, being born again. The gold plating is uh, vested righteousness, purity. Gold represents pureness, purity. So God gives you his own righteousness, all right? Then the testimony or the tablets that is inside of the ark talks about the word of God. Colossians 3.16. Let the word of God dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Okay? So, in a nutshell, the Ark of the Covenant is a prototype of a child of God. Okay? Now, the cherubim's covering is a protection, a form of a protection over that child of God. The mercy seat is God's divine presence. God's presence in the life of that child of God. Amen. So the mercy, the Ark of the Covenant carries, put it this way, carries God. Let me put it that way. By the Old Testament standard, the Ark of the Covenant carries God because the mercy seat is on top of the Ark. And God comes there, he says to Moses, I will be there. I will talk with you from there. That's from where I will communicate with you. So every time they carry the Ark, God was on top of it. And when God is there, his glory is there. His glory is there. His presence is there. His power is there. The component of glory. The components of glory. The five Ps, they are all there when they carry the ark. Hallelujah. That is why for some people, they see prosperity. They see prosperity. When the ark of the covenant gets into their house, into their homes, example, Obededon. Second Samuel chapter 10, sorry, chapter, Second Samuel chapter 6, verse 10 to 12. Second Samuel 6, verse 10 to 12. Obededom, David said, take the ark to Obededom's house. I don't want to die. I don't want to die. In some people's homes, in some people's life, the ark of the covenant manifested in the form of power. The power of God came, boom. And, and destroyed um, Uzzah because he touched it unlawfully. He touched the ark unlawfully, destroyed Uzzah. That brings me to the point to say, anyone who touches you illegally, anyone who touches you unlawfully, anyone who harasses you, who touches God's... Um, see what's going to happen? What happened to Uzzah will happen to them. God is going to strike them. He's going to strike them. Why? Because you carry his glory. You are the prototype of the ark of the covenant. God is on you. God is in you. You carry God's glory, God's manifest presence. They touch you unlawfully. Anyone who touches you unlawfully, anyone who touches you illegitimately, anyone who wants to defraud you, who touches you illegitimately, the power of God will strike them. All right? So you see the manifestation of power, you know, in some people's life. When they took the ark of covenant to the house of Dagon, 1 Samuel chapter 5, Verse 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. First Samuel chapter 5, verse 1 to 5. What happened to Dagon? God's divine presence came on Dagon, and Dagon fell to the ground. So, in each individual, experience the manifestation of, of, of the Ark of the Covenant, the glory of God, in different forms. And the, the, Dagon was broken to pieces. That's power. Then, the presence of God that brings judgment came into the land of the Philistines, and they were he was striking them with emeralds, boils, and the Philistines were dying in different cities because the Ark of the Covenant came in there, God's power for judgment, God's presence began to walk among them and was judging them. But in the same place, the same Ark came to the house of Obededon in 2 Samuel chapter, 5, chapter 6, verse 10 to 12. 2 Samuel 6, 10 to 12, where David was, was, was bringing the Ark, you know, and he said, take it to Obededon's house because I don't want to die. Three months, the ark was there. The glory was there. Three months, the glory was there. And it manifested in form of what? Prosperity. Prosperity, splendor, honor. David was told that God had blessed Obedidom and all that pertains to him. God had blessed Obedidom and his entire household for 90 days, three months by which the ark was there. So you see, manifestation of the ark in front for some other people, it's about prosperity. For some other people, Purity. 
Isaiah saw the glory. He says, my life is impure. Oh, I am nowhere in terms of purity. I am unclean. When he saw the glory of God, hallelujah. Praise God. Peter saw the glory of God. You know, at, at, in Luke chapter 5, when Jesus said, cast the net, and he caught fishes. He said, depart from me, O Lord, for I am a sinful man. That's the manifestation of the glory. And he saw his uncleanness. He saw the fact that he was impure. Praise God. So now, let me move further. Uh, I have a few more minutes before I, I close right now. A few more minutes. Let's move further. So this act is symbolic of the glory of God. We've established it. God is there in, uh, on the ark. The mercy seat is there. You know, and all that. Now, anytime they went for battle, for example, in Joshua chapter 3, when they wanted to cross River Jordan, the ark went ahead first, and the priests who were carrying the ark dipped their feet in the, in the River Jordan, and River Jordan cut off. River Jordan split into two. Hallelujah. River Jordan split into two. As a priest, you know, put their feet on River Jordan. It split into two, and there was a dry land. The Ark of the Covenant, manifestation of what? Of God's presence, God's power was revealed. And Jordan divided into two and they moved on a dry ground. Hallelujah. Praise God. Then, when the children of Israel went to battle, they took the Ark of God along with them. The battle of 2 Samuel chapter 11, David sent Joab to go and fight. The Ark of the Covenant was with them in the field and they were making progress. They defeated their enemies. So it was a symbol of God's presence. And I'm saying to you that you, you ought not to lose any battle. You ought not to lose any battle. Every battle, every war rising against you in the name of Jesus by reason of the fact that you are a carrier of the glory of God, you are a carrier of God's presence, I declare victory for you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Then... Let me begin to conclude. This Ark of the Covenant didn't work for them all the time. I, I, I need you to understand that. It didn't work for them all the time. Yes, there were times the Ark of the Covenant went into dormant states. The power and the presence of God on the Ark went into dormancy, dormant states because of their attitude, because of their lifestyle. First Samuel chapter 2, verse 12. First Samuel 2, 12. He says, the sons of Eli, Ophni and Phineas, were corrupt, and they did not know the Lord. They were what? Corrupt, and they did not know the Lord. The sons of Eli were corrupt, First Samuel chapter 2, verse 12. They did not know the Lord. In fact, the Bible goes further to say, they sleep with the women who come for counseling, they eat, they steal from the offering, they desecrate the altar, and they were service people in church but they didn't know the Lord. That's a very serious matter. So is it possible that there are people who serve in church and don't know the Lord? Is it possible that there are people who play keyboard, who play drums, who are in the media, who serve as ushers? There are people who serve as altar ministers, and yet they don't know the Lord? Is it possible? The Bible says, Ophni and Phineas were involved in active service. In fact, they were privileged to carry the ark, but they didn't know the Lord. I pray for you, and I pray for myself. Our service to God will not be in vain in Jesus' name. Come on, say loud and clear. Say, Father, in the name of Jesus, please don't let my service to you be in vain. Let me know you, O oh God. As I serve you, draw me closer to you. In the mighty name of Jesus, open your mouth and pray. Lord, as I serve you, as I serve in the house of God, as I serve in the kingdom of God, draw me closer, Father, to you. Don't let my life be like that of Ophni and Phineas. Who served, who served actively in church, but they did not know the Lord. Please, Father, as I serve you, let me know you more and more. In the name of Jesus, open your mouth and pray. Say those prayers right now. In the name of Jesus, as I serve you, help me to know the Lord more and more as I serve you, O God. In the mighty name of Jesus, thank you, Almighty Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. So these guys, these guys, were handling the ark. And the Bible said they were very corrupt. In fact, some translation says they were sons of Belial. Some translation says these guys were sons of Belial. And they were in church. And they read Bible to people. They handle events in church, activities. I, for, I forbid that for every one of us to never be a portion. May we not serve God in vain. 
May it not be said to us that we have walked in vain. May we not run in vain. The Apostle Paul said, lest I should have run in vain. I bring under my body. I subject it to discipline. Lest after preaching to others, I myself should be cast away. I pray God will give us the grace to be disciplined. Grace to do what we need to do. So our reward, our, our labor will be rewarded in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, Amen. Praise God. So this is the position now. The dormant state, the active state. So the, the, sons, of, the sons of Phineas, Ophni and Phineas, were carrying the ark. The sons of Eli, Ophni and Phineas, were carrying the ark. And because the ark was with them, they were corrupt. They were fleshy. Adultery, fornication, stealing, uh, wickedness, etc. was found with them. They were manufacturers of evil things, you know. The Ark of the Covenant went into dormant state. Dormant. You know why? It was in the custody of the wrong people whose lifestyle do, do not match the, the Ark of the Covenant. Their lifestyle does not correspond to the Ark of the Covenant. So the, the glory, the manifestation of the glory from the Ark just went into dormant state. That's why some believers complain, oh, you say I'm filled with the Holy Ghost, you say we carry the glory of God. Why am I not seeing it? We need to check ourselves. God can never be at fault. God can never be at fault. It will never be God's fault. The Bible says that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and thou mightest overcome when thou art judged. Hallelujah. He said, let God be true, and let every man be a liar. You see that in Psalm 51. He says, so that you'll be, you'll be righteous and justified when you speak, that thou mightest be, be, be justified when thou speakest, and thou mightest overcome when thou art judged. It's true. It's perfect. There's no darkness in him. There's no lying God. Amen. So if you're not seeing manifestation of the glory of the presence of God in your life, you're not seeing the manifestation of the glory, it's not God's fault. We need to check ourselves. Because God wants us to manifest. Hallelujah. We need to check ourselves. So in First Samuel chapter 5, oh, I have two minutes, and then we'll be, we'll be. In First Samuel chapter 5, scripture says that the Bible declares. He says, no, just start with chapter 4. 1 Samuel 4, verse 1 to 18. 1 Samuel 4, 1 to 18. The, the entire Israel went against the Philistines. Philistines fought the Israelites. They killed thousands of Israeli, Israeli army. And then the people came back disappointed. They started to cry. They called the elders. And the elders said, you know what? <laughs> it's because the Ark of the Covenant was not with us. Go to Shiloh and bring the Ark. So they got to Shiloh. And then Ophni and Phineas said, we are the ones in charge of the ark. We are the ones in charge of the ark. So they carried the ark. And Ophni and Phineas began to move with the ark. Hallelujah. <laughs> These are backsliding guys, corrupt people. If the children of Israel had changed custody of those who carried the ark, they would have won that battle. They would have won. The ark of the covenant would have manifested for them. But they didn't. You know what they did? They put it in charge of Hophni and Phineas. Then they got to the battle. Bam, bam, bam. They destroyed everybody. They killed thousands of Israeli army. They killed Hophni, they killed Phineas. All right? Thousands died. Then they seized the ark. There was no manifestation. It was like nothing even happened. The ark didn't matter. They died like chicken. They died before the enemies. They were disgraced, beaten down before the enemies. And the Ark of the Covenant was there. No manifestation. It was in dormant state. Wow. Then, they kept the Ark in Dagon's temple. That's the God of the Philistines. It's, an, it's a large, massive image. Very tall. Maybe several meters high. Maybe up to five, six, seven meters high. The Philistines worship the image of Dagon. So they took the ark there. They said it's useless thing. They didn't know, the Philistines didn't know that. It was because the people handling it were corrupt, were fleshy, were given to wickedness and works of the flesh. That was why there was no manifestation. They thought that was the general, that was all the ark has got to offer. So they made a mistake of their lives. They took the ark and put it in Dagon's temple. Bam! The moment the ark changed custody, manifestation started again. 
It went from dormant to active. By the next day, Dagon had fallen to the face. First Samuel chapter 5, verse 1 to verse 7 or so. Dagon had fallen to the face. The next day, they, they raised it again. I pray every power that wants to make sickness, disease in your life to relax, to come back again. May God judge those powers in Jesus' name. You know, the devil usually wants to bring it back. He will say, I'll bring it back. The affliction had gone. You check testimony. But the enemy wants to bring it back. Today, I ask the power of God will judge that enemy, judge that affliction, totally, completely, eradicate that affliction from your body in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. So they brought back Dagon to his position the second time. Like the devil always wants to bring back the sickness or the affliction or the pain or the challenge. But you know what? By the third day, bam, Dagon fell and broke into pieces. And they couldn't arrange Dagon again. It only reminds me of the old poem, old nursery poem, Umpty Dumpty sat on the wall. Umpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's men and all the king's horses could not put Umpty Dumpty together again. They fell, broke into pieces. So I prophesy over your life that illness, that challenge, that marital issue, that financial challenge, your business issue, your job issue, the enemy has attacked you and afflicted you, and you gave testimony, and they are planning to bring it back again. I declare it will not succeed in Jesus' name. The enemy will not prevail. The enemy will not work against you. God will bring final and total judgment to your adversary. In the name of Jesus, go forth and prosper. Go forth and shine. Go forth and manifest the glory of God. In the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, precious Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'll pray two more prayers for you because Pastor Tony said I should pray for you. Two more prayers for you. So when the Ark of the Covenant was in the land of the Philistines, 1 Samuel chapter 5, they started falling sick. That was God in action. The power of God started hitting the Philistines, you know, like pandemic, like epidemic. They were falling down with emeralds, sicknesses, and it went like wildfire all over. And the Philistines started to cry. They said, we regret. We regret for touching the Ark. We regret for bringing it here. We thought it was dormant. We thought it was a useless box. We thought it was a, an empty, inactive box. We regret it. Because the Ark of the Covenant went to active state. Active state. May the Holy Ghost in your life go into active state. May the glory of God in you go into active state. In the name of Jesus Christ. They took it to, finally they took it to uh, Kijan Jeren in the house of Abinadab. And he stayed with Abinadab for 20 years. There was nothing to write home about Abinadab. Nothing, no testimony. For some people it's neutral. The presence of God is just neutral. Nothing to write home about. You are just the same. It was in Abinadab's house for 20 years. First Samuel chapter 7, verse 1. You see that. And 2. Then they moved the ark to David's city. The moment he changed custody, the power started to manifest through the ark again and took it to Abinadab's house and there was active manifestation of power. So you see, dormant, active, dormant, active, depending on the people's attitude who carry it. Hallelujah. Today I prophesy over your life. Every alabaster box that won't let you shine, every alabaster box that won't let you manifest, let the box be broken in Jesus' name. In John chapter 12, the Bible talks about the, the box of expensive oil. That's the glory of God inside of that bottle. But they couldn't perceive the odor because it had not been broken. It had not been opened. They couldn't perceive the odor. John chapter 12 in Bethany. And the Bible says that Mary came and opened it and broke it. And the odor began to diffuse. I pray the glory of God in your life will begin to diffuse. If there's a need of breaking, God wants to break some of us. A life of brokenness. He wants to break us so we can manifest. He wants us to be broken, 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 broken. Pride broken. Works of the flesh broken. Propensity for evil and wickedness broken so that the glory can manifest. I pray, Father, for your children watching me right now. Anything that needs to be broken, break it in Jesus' name. Whatever needs to be broken, break it in Jesus' name. Let the alabaster box, whatever it stands for in their lives, be broken in Jesus' name. So the sweet odor can diffuse. 
the sweet aroma of God's presence can diffuse so men can be blessed through our lives. Let it be so in the name of Jesus Christ. And now pray also for those who are sick in their bodies. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I pray for healing for you. I pray for deliverance for you. Somebody watching me right now, I come, I come against every stiff neck. I don't know what happened to your neck, but you are, you are finding you are finding difficult to move the neck. You're watching me right now. Move the neck now. In the name of Jesus, be healed right now. That's right. Move it. Move it. You are healed. In the name of Jesus, I pray for someone who has been having unusual heart beats. I don't know whether it's palpitation, but now the power of God moves into your heart. Touch your heart. Heal your heart. Aha. Uh -huh. That's right. That's right. Receive healing in Jesus' mighty name. I cover you with the blood of Jesus. I declare you are virus free. Virus cannot touch your body. You represent the Ark of the Covenant. You are a carrier of the glory. You are a carrier of the presence of God. So no weapon formed against you shall prosper. As the cherubims are protecting the Ark, so the God of heaven is as, as erected a divine protection over your life. I declare no virus will touch you. We pray for anyone who may have been infected with any illness, any virus, any disease. Receive your healing now in the name of Jesus. Yeah, receive it. Receive it. Yeah, receive it now. I command the symptoms to disappear. Let the blood of Jesus flush out whatever is not of God in your body. Yes. Good. Receive now in Jesus' mighty name. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Just one minute. Pray in the Spirit. Anywhere you are, pray in the Holy Ghost. Just one minute. Something is happening right in the realm of the Spirit. I pray from this moment you begin to manifest the glory of God. Le kato sopra li gede bauso fredi ji kap kori masanda bakori masende lebo. Yes, Lord, I bless uh, Grace Chapel, Chesterfield, United Kingdom. I bless the church. Let the church advance. RCCG Grace Chapel, Chesterfield, advance. Go forward. Go forward. Go forward. Let the glory be revealed in this church. Let the glory be revealed. Be manifest through this church in the name of Jesus. Reba Baba Shika La Baba Baba. I pray for Pastor Toin. I pray for uh, past, pa, Pastor Miss, uh, Pastor Toin Taiwo. And I pray for uh, our daddy also, uh, Pastor Taiwo, in the name of Jesus. I pray for both couples. Let it be well with them. Let God preserve you in Jesus' name. I pray for your children. I pray for members of Grace Chapel. I pray for all the ministers. Let the glory of God be revealed through your lives in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I'm hearing the word in my spirit. There are two people now. You are going to see the manifestation of the glory after the order of Joseph. You're going to say, go tell my people of all my glory, splendor, prosperity, two of you in the name of Jesus. It's going to happen in a few days from now. Events will begin to happen in your favor in the mighty name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Someone's prayer life is bouncing back. Somebody's prayer life is bouncing back. In the name of Jesus, receive revival of prayer right now. In the name of Jesus, come on, hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We give you praise. If you're watching us and you have not given your life to Christ, this is an opportunity. Say, Father, I come to you right now. I open my heart. I receive Jesus into my heart as my Lord and my Savior. I repent from my sins and ask, oh God, I give you my heart today. And those who want to rededicate their lives to Christ, the works of the flesh has weighed you down, so you are not manifesting as you ought. Say, Father, in the name of Jesus, I rededicate my life to you. Oh, Lord, help me, oh God. Help me to know you, to serve you, to love you more. Break the alabaster box in my life. Break the works of the flesh. And let your glory diffuse through my life. In the name of Jesus. Thank you for hearing us, Lord. In Jesus' name, we are praying. Amen and amen. Thank you for having me to be a blessing to you on this platform. May you remain blessed.